Um, hi, my name is Jose, and I came here today to talk to you about uh, a program I have been working on, um, you know, by myself in the last couple of years. And finally, I made it basically to do something useful, and I was so happy about it that I published it like uh, two or three weeks ago. And, um, and well, this is it. It's called Poke, and it is a sort of um, editor for binary data to which you can uh, describe the structure and then edit it in terms of the abstractions that you are defining. I know this is not maybe not that easy to grasp at first, but that's why, okay, I am going to do a little demo on everything. So, first of all, Poke is not finished. I mean, you can already use it to do useful things. Actually, it helps me a lot in my daily work, but this is work in progress. Work that you are, by the way, welcome to join. I will give you, you know, pointers about if you are interested in contributing at the end of the talk. So, why writing something like this? Well, this is an excerpt of a real, of uh, one of the many, 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 many scripts that I have to do my work. I am, I work on the GNU toolchain. I am a compiler um, hacker, mainly. So I work on on GCC, on Binutils, Linker, Assembler, and whatnot. And then I find myself, you know, very often in the need to um, vandalize L files, you know, and object files and libraries and executables, so I can reproduce bugs in, for example, the Linker, right? So I find myself very often in the need to edit, you know, binary files that have some structure. For example, L files. For me, it's very common. And I use things like this. I used in the past things like this. So, for example, using object dump, you know, to get um, the contents of some information, you know, about the, the offset of the text uh, section of an L file with object dump, to parse the output, to somehow operate it with a shell script, and then finally to use dd, the dd command, to patch the object file or to get information from it. Okay, this works. Yeah, sure it does. But it sucks. Why? I mean, look at it, you know? I mean, it, it's, it's crap, basically. It works, but it is fragile, and uh, it, it, it breaks, you know, so often. Also, it is very specific, obviously. If I wanted to do something slightly different, I would need to write another script. Mm, not good. So, at some point, I was like, okay, you know, this is it. I'm not going to continue like this because my amount of scripts is it's increasing all the time. They are breaking all the time, and I am investing so many times, so much time of my work, you know, instead of doing real work to maintain my infrastructure scripts. So then I decided back in 2017 during the summer, I was like, okay, enough. I'm going to write myself a binary editor, you know, that should be generic. And I did not know, you know, where I was getting into, because at initially, you know, I was like, okay, something simple, you know, it should work. So, um, uh, you know, I mean, it took actually a while, because um, initially it was like, okay, very easy. I want to be able to describe the structure of binary data, for example, of L files, right? They have a header, they have the locations, they have this field, this other field, things like that. So then it was, okay. Mm, most of the data I want to describe, usually it is described already by some C library, C header, you know. So it should be, you know, the, the way I want to describe the structure of the data, it, 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 should, it should look like C structs. It should not be that much different. But of course, I, I'm sure that you all know that C actually is, actually is not very good when it comes to describe physical layouts of data because every, everything is undefined, right? And then the C compiler can introduce padding, can introduce alignment, can reorder bit fields, uh, you know, which are less than one octet, things like that. So it should be, I thought, okay, it should be C struct plus something, right? Something extra. Um, then after one month or a couple of months thinking about it, um, I found some existing stuff. One is called Data Script by Gottmar Bach, who is a professor from some American university, I forgot which one, who wrote back in 2010, 2011, a paper about something he called Data Script, which is very similar to what I wanted, actually. But it was not that much satisfactory for some reasons I will talk about after. 
And then there is uh, an aberration which is called 010 editor, which is proprietary, which means that it is unusable and it's very bad for the freedom of everyone and we don't talk anymore about it. So then I just spent a long time, you know, like um, saying, okay, uh, how can I have a description language that at the same time it is flexible enough and at the same time allows me to edit data in a transparent way and so on. You will see it working now. And then, well, finally, I got something that makes sense. And something that makes sense and something that me, in my general stupidity, I'm able to implement. So this is the program. This is how it looks like. Now, I just told you what POC does in a very abstract way. Probably you are still like, OK, what? So it's demo time, all right? I'm going to use POC very fast because we don't have time. I'm going to use POC very fast to POC a relocation in an L file, which basically corresponds to some real stuff that I have, I have to do, you know, like often. So, okay, this is so I can use a not installed POC, you know, but so this is POC. Oh, sorry, first we need an L file. We create an S file. And then this L file it has a relocation. I'm using read elf, you know, which is part of binutils. This is not poked yet. Okay. So let's poke it. So I just open it with poke. And uh, um, what can I do? Okay, first I can take a look. This is the dump command, you know, that basically tells me the bit and bytes on whatever that is in the file. Okay, nothing very, very exciting yet. But I'm always talking about a structure binary data. So what is the structure of this binary data? This is an L file. How can you define in POC the structure of the data you want to edit? Well, using POC with Big P, which is a programming language, which it happens to be a full-fledged programming language, where you can describe data and operate with it. So of course, I have already written a file for elf, which is called elf pk. The files containing POC code, I call them pickles. And uh, basically, you can see here that in a language which is uh, spoke, you know, uh, you can define structs, right? You can define structs, you can define types, you can define things like that. I will explain this later, but very fast for the demo. So. Here, there is a struct which is elf64ehdr. This is the structure, you know, of an elf header, right? And you see here that you don't always, you don't only specify the different fields, but you can actually also specify, you know, like constraints. Like, for example, this is a constraint, which is an arbitrary poke expression that tells that the elf magic number should be like that. So let's poke it. First, I have to load the elf pickle. This basically, you know, like uh, uh, passes, you know, the elf pile, this elf description through poke. Now poke knows about those types. Um, so um, again, dump. Well, there should be an elf file at the beginning of the file. How do I get it? Well, I map it. This weird thing with the hash B is an offset, which is zero bytes. I will explain more about it later. And it gives me, it gives me the value. Of course, I can put it in a variable. So each EHDR is a, it's a struct variable that basically contains the elf header that is at the, starts at the beginning of the file. Of course, once I map a value and put it in a variable, I can access, you know, uh, the different fields. And I can also, you know, update them. Okay, what happens if I try to map an L file starting at the first byte of the file instead of the zero byte of the file? Oops. I get a, a constraint violated exception. Why? Because the constraints which define, you know, which are defined on the on the on this specific struct, which in this case is the elf header, they are not satisfied with the data at this offset in the file. So then I get 
a constraint violation error, right? Exception. OK, but I have a header. So what is our goal? To vandalize that relocation. How can I get to a relocation in an ELF file? OK, I have, I have the ELF header. I don't know how you're familiar with this format, but you have the ELF header. And then in the ELF header, you have a field, which is called ESHOF for section header offset, which contains the offset in the file to the beginning of the section uh, header table. OK? The section header table, as its name implies, is basically a sequence of different things of, of header entries, right? Of section headers. How many of them? Well, it's also in the header. It's called shnum. So how can I get it from the file? I map. At what offset? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, what are the entities that I want to map here? Section headers. I have this another struct definition here. So this is basically map this number of section headers, you know, uh, at this specific offset from the file. Okay, what happened? The HDR. HDR. Hmm. Yes, it's not. There you go. So this is an array. I can put it also in a variable. So this is an array. The size of the array is that in bytes. It contains, OK, let's put it in decimal. It contains 11 sections, right? So which section are we interested in? The one containing relocations, right? How can we identify that section? Well, by the section flags or by the name, for example. How can we get the name of, a, of an ELF section? For example, let's pick the first section, right? Or the seventh section, <laughs> for example. SH name. But what is SH name? SH name in an ELF file is not a real string. It's the offset of the string in the, in the ELF file a string table, you know, that gives you the string. OK, you see that this is not very nice, you know, like the formats, but this is the kind of stuff we have to work, you know, like usually with. So usually in ELF and in many formats, it is a pain in the ass every time you need to know what is this string? Oh, it is in the string table. OK, what a string table? Well, usually it is pointed by the header, blah, blah. So that's why in poke, you can also define functions like this one here. This is a poke function that given a, an ELF header and an offset, it looks in the, it looks for the string table and gives you, you know, the proper string. So for example, you can call it like this. And pop, this is the section we were looking for. This is not by chance, you know, I mean, I have done this before, before the talk, I mean. Um, so this is the section we are interested in. So we know that we are interested in SHDR7. Okay, fine. SHDR7, it has a name, a type, a flag, what do we want? The section headers in the L files, they have a pointer, which is another offset, yes, it's always like this, to the contents of the section in the file. Where it starts? SHDR. Where it starts in SH offset. So, what do we want to map at SH offsets? We want to map, in this case, relocations, because we know that this section contains relocations. So there is a, a struct definition for relocations too. It's just five lines that you, you write, you know, to describe it. How many of them? Well, here you see one of the peculiarities that usually you find in object files and in object formats. ELF is not telling you how many elements in a section you have. It's telling you how much space occupies, you know, the elements in, in the section. Fortunately, POKE allows you to map arrays not only by number of elements, but also by size. And it does the right thing. So here you can pass this. SH size. So OK, here we have an array 
of one relocation because we only have one relocation. <coughs> All right? So we can do the like, uh, oh, my relocation. It is this array. And this is the relocation I want to vandalize. Let's do it. Let's put an add end of 666. Done. We get out. We do read elf. And mission accomplished. All right? So this was the demo. Now, this is what you can do with poke. Now, you may say, OK, this was, you know, like uh, very stupid. OK, maybe it was stupid. But you can do something slightly different or completely different with a completely different object format by writing a pickle of 50 lines. And this saves a lot of time, at least for people like me. So, you saw here that I was using a pickle and loading it and, you know, and using sort of a language. The language is called poke, right? And I, now I'm going to tell you very fast, very quickly, the different characteristics of it, but only the interesting ones, what it makes, makes it different to other programming languages, right? First, the, the language has support for values, like any other you know, language. You can specify integers in different numeration bases. You, ca you have strings, which are null terminated. You have arrays. Um, you don't have multidimensional arrays, but you can have arrays of arrays. And you have structs, right? Nothing special here. But then, let's see the first characteristic that makes POC, you know, special. Um, when I designed this program, one of the first problems I found was, hmm, should I make it byte-oriented or bit-oriented? Right? I mean, option A, OK, I'm going to make it byte-oriented. Why? Because 99% of the object formats around um, are byte-oriented, right? So when it comes to specify offsets and things like, or sizes or whatever, it should be in bytes. OK, fine. Cons of this approach. Well, that if you are one of the 1%, you know, who has is unfortunate enough to have to implement deflate, for example, or any other bit-oriented format, then this program is not for you. I'm sorry. And I did not want that. Option B. OK, I wanted to make it general. But if I make it bit-oriented, it's going to be a real, real pain for 99 of the users, because you can imagine. <laughs> you know, I mean, you will get sick multiplying by it everywhere, right? So. I was like, okay, bytes, bits, bits, bytes, okay, bytes, but not bits. And I was getting crazy. But unfortunately, in Frankfurt, we do, from time to time, I do with some friends, we, we are called, we call ourselves the rabbit herd, we do like hacking weekends. And then on one of those hacking weekends, I told my friends, hey, look, okay, I have this problem. So then we brainstorm, and then we come with an idea, which is united values, which is in poke, you have like normal, in any other normal programming language, like pure magnitudes, like 23. 23 what? 23 nothing. 23. And also, you have only for offsets, right? What they call offsets in POC, because usually you edit files, but sizes, memory, you have united uh, name units, you know, united types which are called values, which they call offset values. So you can specify something like this, like 8 bits, 23 bytes, 2 kilobytes. That was the initial idea. Now, this has many advantages, and actually, it's, a pretty, it's very, a, pretty, a very pretty concept. But then I was like, hmm. But you know, to have a list of predefined um, uh, units, I, I, you know, it's, it's, it sounds limited. So why not allowing you know, to specify any arbitrary unit? So for example, this is an offset of eight units of eight bits each, eight bytes, basically. And this is uh, two units of three bits each, OK? But then I thought, well, why are they stopping here? Why can't you be able to specify offsets and sizes also in terms of your own types? So for example, this is a value, which is 23 packets, a packet being, you know, that struct that you are defining just before that. Of course, this only works for uh, data structures in POC, which are, whose size is known at compile time, right? Because that's not always the case. But it's useful enough. So you can operate in terms of packets. Of course, this, those are the operations that makes you know like a little algebra of offsets. If you add an offset to another offset, what do you get? Another offset. 
if you multiply an offset by an integral, but a magnitude, you get another offset. If you divide, you get a magnitude, right? If it's like if you divide meters by meters, what do you get? A, a pure magnitude. And you also have uh, the, the rest, the modulus, which is another offset, obviously. Um, the offsets are beautiful also because it allows you, you know, to think in terms of units like when you are doing like physics, for example. So for example, how many, um, how many, um, if, if you have, if you define the f-type packet, which is a struct of an integer and a long, like in the example in the slides, right? How many bytes are in one, are in one packet? Well, you divide in one packet, how many bytes? Oops. Yeah, okay. Sorry. 12 bytes. In POC, when you write a unit, and, and in 23 packets, 276 bytes. If you write a united value, you can omit the magnitude if it is one. So, if I, if I write it like this, how does this look like? <laughs> Like if you are doing physics or whatever, you know, and you are working with units like in your, in your maths or your physics, right? I think it's quite cute and nice. And also allows you to operate and do conversions without having to have size of and things like that, right? It's, it's very nice. Um, also, it has a very nice side effect, which is that often in object formats and in object files, you have fields which give you the, an offset in the file or the size of something else in some specific unit. Some formats, for example, this is in ELF, this is the size of the section pointed with this, by the section header. It happens that the size is in bytes. This is how you specify in POC a type, an offset type, right? So if you was using C, Python or whatever, to edit your object file, you need, you need to remember what is the unit every time before writing into it, right? And you have to convert to bytes, to convert to bytes every time. So if you are working in relocations, for example, and you want to write 10 relocations in this section from your C program or your Python program or whatever, then you have to remember the unit and you have to do the conversion. In POC, you can just assign because POCs know the unit of the destination of the assignment and also of the source. So it will do, what it, it, will do it for you. So this was the first thing of the language which is different to probably what you have seen until now. Um, of course, this was the values. Now, POC has types. It has uh, integral types, which is for signed integers and unsigned integers. Another thing that is different in POC than in most other programming languages in other programming languages, normally you have integers which by default are, I don't know, maybe 32 bits, right? Or maybe 64 bits or whatever. Or uh, in POC, at an integer can be of any number of bits from 1 to 64. And actually plan to expand it to infinite number of bits. And I'm not talking about bit masks or anything like that. I'm talking about proper values of 7 bits or 3 bits, 1 bit, 5 bits, whatever. Okay, and you can operate with them accordingly. Hmm? So you can define those types using this syntax, which I think is pretty readable. Also, in the offset types, you have offset types, which is a proper value in POC. You know, offsets are a first class citizen in POC. And then one string type because there is only one type for strings. And of course, you also have compound types, which is what you use to define the structure of the data you want to use. Um, uh, arrays are picky in POC, because to be honest, when I started it, I always thought, okay, arrays will be easy, you know, and it is structs that are going to be painful to implement and design. Uh, structs were easy. Arrays were the complicated ones, surprisingly. Um, basically, in POC, you have three types of arrays, the array types in the language. You have what unbounded arrays, which is an array of a not defined number of integers, for example, like in this example, then you, can, you have arrays bounded by number of elements, which can be constant, like two integers, or can be variable. You, 
You know, POC is a, a lexically scoped uh, block-oriented language, so you, it has closures and you can do all sorts of, uh, of unspeakable things with it. And, um, or it can be variable. Or, as we saw in the demo, edit in the L file, you can also bound an array type by size. So, for example, this array can, can contain the same number of integers than that array. Array of this type of an array of that type, which is two, right? But this one is bounded by size, and that one is bounded by number of elements. And we will see in the next slide, or in the, one of the next slides, that that has an impact when you map it. And also, of course, you know the queen of poke, the struct, all right? Which is what you use to actually define your, uh, your data structures. I will go very fast with, with, through this, and I'm very sorry, but I have no time. Um, first, OK, a packet, you know? OK, this, a packet consists in, in a file or in memory of a byte, which is a magic number, of an unsigned integer of 32 bits, which is the length of what follows. And then an array of bytes of data length, you see you can use you know, fields that, that has been read just before or before to define um, um, our, uh, the data after that, which is the data. This will be the typical definition of a variable length uh, uh, packet, for example. Also, though this is not implemented yet, you can pass arguments to the structs, because a struct is also a closure in poke. You know, you can actually also define variables inside of it and functions. Hmm? You can pass uh, arguments that sometimes it's, it's, it's useful. Also, it is very typical in, in, in object files, in, this, in object formats, that uh, the structs, they have holes in it. You know, the structure of something, it has holes in it. For example, typical example, there are files who have two headers, one at the beginning of the file, one at the end. Or, it, you have a header and then you have an offset to whatever other data, you know. Think about, for example, a, a struct, a poker struct, which is, which is an extended to, extended to file system, which is a header or a super block that points to a super block and then the super block points to the different super blocks. It is a sparse, there are holes in, the, in it, right? So, in poke, you can specify, I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer. In poke, you can specify at the offset of a field using what they call a label. A note, here you can put any expression that evaluates to an offset, right? And this is how I fix this problem of byte, bit, or bit of byte. Hmm? Um, and this offset, for example, in this case, is part of the struct itself. You see? It is very flexible. I know this syntax is very bad, but uh, this is one of the syntax words that they will fix as soon as I can get rid of the Bison parser I'm using at the moment uh, and use a recursive descent written by hand. Because I want to use the normal C syntax of a label, you know, like a prefix and a colon. But for syntax issues, you know, and LALR grammars, uh, it's not a choice right now. Okay. Also, you can have pint structs, which is exactly what we understand by unions in C. I call them pinned because it's like if the fields inside, they are pinned, you know, to the same, uh, it's like, you know, a little tree, right? Why? Because in a pinned struct, usually in poke, uh, one f this field starts immediately after the first one, right? But if the struct you define it to be pinned, the different fields start at the same offset in IO space. I call IO space the file that you are editing. So it's like a C struct. Right? So this is basically also from ELF, and it's telling you that you have an ST info, which is you can interpret it either as an unsigned integer of 32 bits of, or as a 28-bit uh, ST bind or 4-bit uh, ST type. All right? It's le le like a C union. And then you may ask, why did you not call it union? Because POC has union types too. What is the poke union? This is a concept I got from data script, and I really love it. Basically, you have seen that a poke struct definition is basically the specification of a decoding process. Because if you look at it from an astronaut point of view, poke is nothing else than from the normal process of decoding, computing with the data, and encoding back, basically subtracting you from the encoding and the decoding, and you can focus on the, on the, on the computing. Um, so when you write in poke struct, 
you are basically in a sort of a declarative way, you are teaching poke, you know, how to decode your data, right? The unions give you conditionals. So, in the struct type, in the struct type, you can use constraints, which is to every field you can specify an arbitrary poke expression, which has contained calls to functions and what, what not, you know, anything you can imagine. Also mappings, although that is a very obscure area I'm not sure I want to get into very much yet. But, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, to specify constraints associated with the fields. So, how do you do conditionals in poke in your data structures? Um, with unions. So, in unions, you have uh, different fields too, like in this one. So, how does it work? POC will try to decode every alternative in the union, starting from the first one, and then the first alternative for which no constraint is violated is chosen. And this is recursive. You know, I mean, the, the constraint should not be immediately in the field of the, of, the, of the union. The union can have a struct, we can have a struct, and so on. Any constraint that fails, that invalidates this union, you know? So, for example, here you have, uh, uh, you have an example which is from the uh, tag format in MP3 files, you know? Artist, uh, name of the song, and you know, things like that. It uses this format. Um, so here, for example, you have an ID of this frame, whose is, is four charts, the first one cannot be zero, then you have a size, and then what comes next, it depends. It depends. If the first byte here equals t, then what comes next is depend of the value of size. If it is bigger than one, it is two fields, you know, this idea is string zero, and then an array of size minus one. Otherwise, there is an, an array of characters of size size, of, which is called frame data. If the ID zero t, it's not. Uh, if the ID zero is not t, then it comes an array of size charts uh, frame data. Now you may wonder, is the, how is this different to this? Well, it is different because you have this. This happens only if ID zero is not t. And this happens if ID t zero is t and size is not bigger than one. I know it is a bit, you know, it takes a little bit to get used to, to, to those unions, but when you do, oh, yeah, but what, what you do, you know, it's quite nice. Okay, POC supports polymorphic types, um, so you can, you know, write generic code. Um, it is lexically scoped, you have variables and whatnot. Um, and then mapping, and this, I, I, it's worth it to waste time on this. So I was, okay, I map this, I map that, okay. Um, in POC you have variables, like def bar A, like for example. This is an array of three elements, you can, I can access them, right? But, if I open a file, I can have also, I map three integers and the, at this offset. So B is also an array of three integers, and A is an array of three integers, right? So what is the difference? Well, the difference is that A is not mapped and B is mapped. So if I do A equal 10, okay, it changes the value of the second element of A, but if I say B1 equals 10, I change it in the variable as well, but I change it, you know, in the IO space. So it has a side effect. So B has an offset, A has not an offset. So for example, you know, okay, this is it, right? So the, the, the central idea of POKE is that you should be able to work with normal not mapped values and mapped values transparently. So you can write, and actually you can do it, you can write, I don't know, um, a function that sorts relocations and you can sort an array of relocations in memory, like in normal variable, but if, the, if that variable is mapped in some file or some memory, it will also sort it, you know, in the back end. This is, that sounds very simple. This is what took me, you know, like months, you know, to actually get it right, because it was a schizophrenia, you know, okay, what is mapped, the value of the type? No, it is the type, no, it is the variable, no, it is the value, no, it's the variable, no, no, no. And I think I got it right. It is values which are mapped or not. And only, and only complex values. 
So this is the mapping, what they have been told, in, right? And uh, you use the map operator, which is like that. Now, in POC, you have functions, right? Um, it is, again, basically a scope. It is nice. It supports uh, optional arguments. It supports uh, variable length arg argument list two as an array of any. Also, I am a huge fan of Algol 68, and one of the things I like more about Algol 68 is that uh, if a function doesn't ar get argument, you can actually use it in the same way that it, if it, like if it was sort of a variable, which I like much. And this was about the language. So now, unfortunately, I wanted to tell you how it works internally, but it's going to be super fast. So this is the architecture of the, of the, of the thing, of the application. This, you have a command part, which is the read line, you know, and all the things, boring. Um, then you have a compiler, right, which actually compiles pickle, uh, uh, poke, sorry, into, into a virtual machine, which is the poke virtual machine. And it is the virtual machine through these instructions that access the IO space, in this case, the file. So here, this is the structure of the compiler. At the right, you have uh, the disassembly of, of the POC virtual machine instructions, which is a stack machine, because I love stack <coughs> machines, of the expression that you see there. Please ignore the prolog and the epilog. Those are the different passes and phases of the compiler. It, it, has const it has constant folding, some optimizations. I mean, it's not a toy. It's actually a very cute compiler. I invite you to see it in the source code. I have, I made myself a macro assembler to not go crazy while writing the runtime and the code generator. Actually, I wrote an AWK assembler, so I can write the runtime of, of POKE and also, you know, the code generator routine, uh, routines, you know, like in proper assembly like this. Yeah. Then the IO subsystem basically abstracts what you are editing. Uh, from a space of bytes into a space of, of, of I.O. objects, which can be those integers, strings, or whatever. Um, the important uh, detail of this is that it doesn't have to be a file, all right? It could be a, a process that you access the memory using ptrace or whatever. Uh, it could be a file system because you maybe want to edit your extended do to or whatever, right? It doesn't matter. Anything that can be addressed by bytes uh, can be poked. Um, then POC is extensible. Why? Because you, ex you can extend the application in POC. So for example, uh, you saw, okay, this is a very syn a syntax trick I feel very proud of, but I don't have time to explain it to you. Anyway, um, the dump command I have been using is basically written in one POC function, right? You will see that uh, the, the, um, the arguments, you know, they all have a default value. So, for example, you can say dump from the offset size b size, right? So you can pass arguments like that. And those arguments, uh, to define the new command, oops, I'm sorry. No. To define the new commands, basically, um, you do it by writing a poke function. What happened here? E. Yeah, there you go, a POC function here, all right? So that's all you have to do to extend it. Now, pickles are POC source files containing a collection of related goodies, type definitions, functions, whatnot. Like ELF, it, I have a test suite. It, it needs more tests, but, uh, um, and it sort of works. This is reassuring, right? I hope it is. So what works? Most of what I have told you today is working in POC. Um, only one kind of I.O. devices, which is files and things like that. But we need more commands and we need, and also there is a lot before a first release can be done. You know, supporting unions, for example, which is work in progress. Support for sets, for enumeration, bitmaps, bit bitmasks, and things like that. More control sequences in the language. I have a for loop. But you know, it is so cheap to add control, uh, you know, control sentences that, well, I don't know. Um, and then after the first release, this is a list of big projects I want to do, you know, um, in general. But there is still a lot of work to do. So those are the links for the project. If you want, you know, to contribute, I have a home page, you know, and, um, um, a mailing list, and also we have an IRC challenge in Freenode. 
And uh, if, uh, if you think that POC could be useful for you and you ha want to have fun, uh, please see the hacking file you know in the source directory, in the source tree, because it contains a lot of information that will be useful for you. All right? So, done. In time? Yes? Yes. So, yeah, any questions? We can have six minutes for questions. Uh, how do you handle padding and uh, bit uh, NDNS? Um, NDNS at the moment, you basically, you can set the NDN to little, big, or host, basically. Um, I want to add a, a function that you can put in a, in a struct uh, um, constraint that will change the NDNS, you know, in runtime, you know, when it is decoding. But that's not implemented yet. According, and regarding to padding, there is no padding. I mean, in poker, uh, if you have an integer which is, you know, like seven bits, it's seven bits. And, it, you know, in that sense, it is bit oriented. It doesn't pad, it doesn't align. What you describe is what you poke. <laughs> Ah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, did you take a look at Kaitai structs already? So, do you know this project? K Kaitai, so K A I T T A I. Okay. Because no. they they um, it's an open source program as well. Yes. Where, but it's meant completely the other way around. You define some um, binary structures, and it's meant to compile into several languages reader, so parser of this. Awesome. Maybe you can yeah. take their definitions yeah. Yeah. and convert it to yours as well. So I mean, yeah. we have a big repository of binary file definitions. Maybe. Okay, no, but I will take a look because I want to translate all that to yeah, They have MP3 to and yeah. stuff. And so. Yeah, very nice, yes. But it's oriented to, to write encoders and decoders, right? Uh, decoders in, in only. Encoders, okay, yeah. Is it possible to invoke any of these things as a library for, say, if you needed to parse files and um, use the, um, the pickle definitions that are available with poke? It will, yes. Actually, uh, poke, it started as an editor, you know, that's the main idea. But r right now, I really think that it could be a very nice foundation for writing prototypes or binary utilities. Like, one of the things that I, I'm going to write on very soon is a proper diff and patch for structured binary data, right? Based on POC descriptions, yes. More questions? Um, just to make sure that I got it right, um, would it be a, a tool where you can just define a binary um, schema once and then use it for writing and reading binary files? So all that you do with your files, you could use this libpoke for? Well, um, from, from poke language in this case, yes. I mean, could be also, many people is asking me, hey, can I have a poke to see? Like, can I have POC to generate an encoder like this other tool is doing, or an add encoder? Yeah, why not? We can have a pickle written in POC itself, you know, that writes C out. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That would be welcome, actually. Would be useful. We can still have one question. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, well, thank you. Thank you, Again.